Good evening, brothers and sisters from Western Indonesia, Central Indonesia, and Eastern Indonesia. Welcome back to the uh, lecture, The Greco-Roman World of the New Testament Era with Professor Gary M. Birch, PhD, October 15th and 22nd, 2000. 21. I would like to ask Johnny to uh, share your screen uh, to show the slides like we did uh, last week. Okay, I will present uh, to this evening's agenda. Next slide, please. Yeah, uh, we will have uh, the lecture today uh, with the subtitle, The Dew Jewish World of Jesus and Paul. It will be given by a professor uh, in approximately 40 minutes, all right? And then we will have a question and answer session, all right, led by me, okay? And hopefully we don't forget to Taking to take pictures together as probably the artifacts <laughs> that we will have, you know, uh, from this moment, right? And then we're gonna have a break for 10 minutes, right? And then uh, the second session of uh, this evening's last lecture will be the same The Jewish World of Jesus and Paul by Professor. And then we will have the question and answer uh, for another. 10 minutes and then we will come to an end. Okay, at start, uh, I would like to ask uh, Pa Johan Juandi from STT Amanat Agu to lead us in the opening prayer. Uh, Othniel, could you uh, bring uh, Baba Johan Juandi? Uh, to the Zoom screen. Thank you. Do we have Pat Johan? Ya, selamat malam. Kita akan berdoa untuk memulai webinar malam hari ini. Kita berdoa bersama. Bapak kami sungguh bersyukur, berterima kasih kembali saat ini, baik mungkin malam hari di Indonesia dan waktu lain di berbagai belahan dunia lain, bagi saudara-saudara kami yang mengikuti dari berbagai tempat, kami boleh berkumpul secara virtual untuk mengikuti satu lecture yang sangat berharga dari Dr. Birch ini. Kira Tuhan yang memberkati dalamnya cara malam hari ini, baik sesi yang diberikan presentasi maupun tanya jawab, semuanya ini boleh memberikan insight-insight yang berharga bagi kami semua untuk kami mendalami dunia perjanjian baru, latar belakang perjanjian baru, sehingga kami boleh lebih memahami firman Tuhan dengan baik, dan juga kelak pelayanan kami, pengajaran kami, khotbah kami juga lebih efektif. Terima kasih Tuhan. Berkatilah seluruh rangkaian acara malam ini dan semua teknologi yang dipakai di masing-masing tempat Tuhan yang jamah tolong supaya berfungsi dengan lancar. Untuk kemuliaan Kristus, semua kami serahkan demi nama Tuhan Yesus, saya bersyukur dan berdoa. Amin. Thank you, Pak Johan. Terima kasih, sama-sama. Oke, okay. Johnny, could you uh, share uh, the screen again for the slides? I would just repeat the uh, protocol of our lecture tonight, just as a reminder, and also a ex next, another explanation about the... Uh, Uh, assignment of essay for brothers and sisters who want to uh, get uh, the e-certificate uh, signed by professor. Yeah. We are waiting for the slide to come in. Thank you, Johnny. Okay, it's coming in. Okay, 
Uh, the lecture protocol, again, we would like to re uh, remind, uh, please rename uh, your name in Zoom. We have the following format, name, school, and region. Uh, for instance, uh, Bapak Joko from SETAA, Jakarta. So it's, uh, we will know each other. Okay. Uh, for the Q&A, we only received, like last week, uh, the written questions only. All right. And all questions shall be directed or, or texted uh, to Johnny slash Q&A. And then you can ask questions in both English or Indonesian, even during the lecture. Okay, I think it's, uh, it's clear. Next slide, please. Yeah, this is the agenda. Uh, next, uh, next. Yeah, again, uh, for e-certificate, all right, uh, 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 we, we are happy, uh, the committee is very happy that uh, several questions uh, are coming in to our secretary, the, uh, showing up your enthusiasm uh, to get this e-certificate. This is just a reminder that all participants will get e-certificate of completion, all right, signed by professor. I think, uh, Johnny, next we have the uh, translation in Bahasa Indonesia version, yeah. Uh, Ger, Pak Profesor, if you don't mind, we will uh, speak in Bahasa first, in Bahasa Indonesia. So, seluruh peserta akan mendapatkan e-sertifikat ditandatangani ditanda langsung oleh Profesor Gary Emberge dengan syarat-syarat sebagai berikut. Menyerahkan makalah esai, seribu kata, satu setengah spasi, bisa dalam bahasa Inggris atau Indonesia, dari salah satu. Jadi, uh, nanti passages-nya akan kita terangkan di pada saat break. Jadi Bapak Ibu hanya memilih salah satu dari tiga perikop, ya. Terus makalah di email ke rasmita ginting at gmail.com atau nomor handphonenya paling lambat tanggal 29 Oktober 2021. Kami memohon Bapak Ibu untuk membuat cover makalah yang berisi nama lengkap dan gelar Bapak Ibu. Ya, syarat ketiga adalah menghadiri full attendance. Ya, secara penuh tanggal 15 dan 22 Oktober. Terima kasih Bapak Ibu telah mengisi attendance list uh, uh, minggu lalu, ya, mengisi form kehadiran dan mohon juga mengisi pada tanggal 22 Oktober. Dan diharapkan dosen institusi yang mengutus memberikan penilaian atas tugas mahasiswa yang berkat bersangkutan. Oke. Okay. Now, uh, next slide please. Okay, not yet. Okay, later we will uh, uh, explain about this again. So, uh, Professor, uh, without further ado, uh, brothers and sisters from Grand Rapids, uh, Michigan, United States, here, Professor Gary Embert. Thank you very much. It's uh, great to be back with everyone. Um, uh, it's uh, morning for me, it's evening for you, and uh, I highly respect how much you are investing in this class uh, together. Um, so I'm going to share my screen right now and uh, you should be able to see <clears throat> soon enough, uh, here we go, the uh, full image which I am putting up. You guys good with that? Everybody, I'm assuming you have that. Okay, <clears throat> so. Thank you, Professor. Are we okay? Okay. Sorry, uh, we see clearly your slide. Thank you. Okay, good. All right, good. So <clears throat> as you guys, as, as everyone knows, what we've been talking about here is how do we interpret the, the New Testament? That is really the question. That's the, that's the item on the table. And I have suggested to you last week that um, contextual exegesis is what we do. In other words, we want to interpret, that's exegesis. We want to lead out the meaning, but we need to do it from context. Um, and uh, I just simply want to reinforce that to you, um, because if you don't do that, you run the risk of misrepresenting a text. Um, here's an example. You can see the photo, which is behind these words. These are <clears throat> two tombs, which are just outside of Jerusalem. And uh, these tombs are often pointed out. Uh, people see them and they think, oh, my goodness, they must be tombs from the kings of Israel. And, uh, or, or a tomb that belongs to one of the prophets. But, you know, um, just 
even with the slightest information, you would know immediately this is from the Hellenistic world. You can see a pyramid here. You can see here, these are Doric capitals. So I can look at the architecture of this entire scene right here, and I can tell that <clears throat> these are tombs of very wealthy Jews who were in the Hellenistic period, and they have nothing to do with the Old Testament. Now, how do I, <clears throat> how do I know that? I know that because simply I have some background. Now, um, as we begin to work on contextual exegesis, we might think about it this way. Um, I have been looking online at Jakarta, Indonesia. Do you guys recognize this picture? This is, so I'm told, downtown Jakarta. I've never been there before, but, you know, I look at that picture and I think to myself, what would it be like to be in this beautiful city um, by myself even, you know? Well, I'll tell you what, it's sort of intimidating. Jakarta's kind of scary, really. It should be for someone like me. I mean, I wouldn't know where I am. I, I don't know the language. I don't know the history of this country. I don't know the culture of this country. And basically, you would end up lost. Well, unless you've got a guide or you have an interpreter, you really are not going to make very much progress understanding Jakarta. So I think that's fairly obvious. Foreign tourists uh, need help. That's the way it is. So my question to you is this. Um, are you and I a foreigner when we open the Bible? And I would suggest to you that we are, because <clears throat> when many people open the Bible, they, they don't know where they are. Um, they, they have difficulty understanding uh, what a book of the Bible means. They, they, people refer to um, the letters of John as the book of 1 John. It's not a book. It's like two pages. So how can that be? They don't know the language. They see this Hebrew and Greek possibly, and they hear references to it. They're, they're lost. They don't know the history, which is behind these stories. They don't know the culture. So essentially, you are lost. So you have to have a guide. So that's the very same idea that I've been trying to reinforce with everyone as we've been moving along. <clears throat> so context matters. So we have to be able to reconstruct what it is that we have uh, behind the text. <laughs> every story, every text Every piece of music, every art, every building actually has got a context behind it. And the context is sometimes barely visible to us. Now, what are the three things that I've suggested that you and I need to know if we're going to be successful working with context? The first is you have to know the land. Remember I said this last week. This is just a review, basically. You have to know the land. You have to know where things happen. So when I see Jakarta, Frankly, I don't know if it's in Eastern Indonesia or if it's in Western Indonesia. I don't know if it's in Central Indonesia. I know it's in Indonesia, but so I don't have any sense of the geography of the place, but you have an instinctive understanding of this. And therefore you would think it's obvious. The biblical writers think it's obvious that you know where things like this great harbor of Caesar was built. <clears throat> the second thing is you have to know the history. Um, you have to know what has shaped these people politically, historically, over the last uh, couple hundred years. And I think I told you last time that um, I have a number of Korean students, and the Korean students tell me about their history in the 20th century, about the Japanese occupation. And I didn't know, had no idea about the Japanese occupation of, of, um, of Korea. So therefore, without knowing the history, I, I cannot understand some of the things that are important values to them. So the second thing in context is we have to know the history. The third is we have to know the culture. We have to know somehow the reflexes of the people. We have to have an idea how they live. Like, for instance, this is a sheep culture. This is not a cattle and beef culture. This is a culture with sheep and lambs, and, 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 and that's uh, how they lived. Uh, in fact, uh, people often ask me, says, well, do they eat these sheep? Are you kidding? You ate meat very rarely, only on festivals, very rarely, because these sheep, uh, they're, they're providing milk, they're providing uh, wool for you. No, you protect these animals, okay? So anyway, when we do contextual exegesis, then what we're doing is we're trying to put together those things that are behind the scenes, those things that are, you might say, behind the curtain. And that's why I like to say our motto ought to be for our class here, uh, context is king. Make sure you write that down. <clears throat> context is king. That is really what leads to an effective interpretation of, of, of the scriptures. It really does. You and I are foreigners 
when we step into the scriptures. However, we are invited foreigners. God wants us to read the scriptures, and with excellent study, the good books, prayer, and the Holy Spirit, we'll be able to attain the, the meaning that we want from the scriptures. <clears throat> Now, um, our last week, what we did is we talked about uh, the Greco-Roman world, which is commonly called Hellenism. Um, but today, what we want to do is focus on Judaism, because remember, every character inside of my New Testament virtually is Jewish, um, with a couple of exceptions. But, but, you know, Paul is Jewish. Jesus, of course, is Jewish. And they're living inside of a Jewish culture. But let's first of all make something absolutely clear. <clears throat> Hellenistic Judaism is what we're talking about. We run the danger of separating off uh, Hellenism or the Roman culture, Greek culture, from Judaism when we divide them by one week like this. And I do not want you to think that in some manner the Jews were able to live a life separate from the Hellenistic world. They weren't. The Hellenistic world was permeating everything that they were doing. So <clears throat> Hellenism really did change Judaism, and to a certain extent, uh, it, it, it shaped the kind of things that we have today. Here, by the way, is um, a burial site, an necropolis, in a place called Beit Sharim in Galilee. And what's remarkable about this burial site is you have these Jewish symbols here, a menorah, clearly. But then when you look at the tombs, you can see they're all built just as a Hellenist, a Greek, would build their tombs. So <clears throat> there is a lot of interplay back and forth. So here's another example of this. Here's some graffiti found in that tomb. This is kind of an interesting piece, uh, only for one reason, really. It's amateur. It's not professional, of course, like that last one I showed you. But here you can see that very same menorah <clears throat> done in a very, I don't know, almost childish way. And then the word star at the very top. Um, I'm not sure what austere means in this place. Now, what, what, is, what is going on? We, the, the Rome was an empire. It had an imperial reach that moved all the way across the Mediterranean. And last week, I showed you a map of how large Rome was, from North Africa to the Eastern Mediterranean, all the way to Spain and France. So it, it was really enormous. And Jews were assimilating into this. They, an empire that big, something that enormous, um, holding out for many people many opportunities, um, was not something that you could deny. You could not walk away from that. It was, uh, you know, resistance was was futile. <clears throat> so if you imagine yourself being a Jew in the Roman world, what would be the, some of the markers that would, would shape how you looked at your world? Well, we already said last week, language. You might know how to speak some Greek. You might be someone like Paul who is regularly reading the Old Testament in Greek. Those, are, those symbols, LXX, stand for the Septuagint. So that's one thing <clears throat> that certainly you would have been experiencing that you had not really experienced before. Second thing is worldview and diversity. An empire means that <clears throat> with the peace of Rome, people will moving around the empire. And so therefore, um, you're going to have exposure to people that you have never been exposed to. Keep in mind that Israel, Judaism was a very tribal environment that, and right up to the Hellenistic period, there were very few Jews that were moving around the Mediterranean. But now all of a sudden, um, the world seemed safe and you were will willing to step out into that world. But I can show you examples of clothing, how <clears throat> the clothing of the Jews began to change. I'll show you a couple of examples. Um, entertainment, we have theaters suddenly. We are excavating um, an enormous theater which is up in Galilee, just behind Nazareth. And we're thinking, wow, did Jews go to theater? They never had theaters before. You can see uh, public architecture. And that was very much a Greek and Roman idea that cutting enormous stones, that takes technology. The Jews never had that. Even the gathering in the synagogue, that is that, that kind of gathering where you would have discussions like this. Many, many scholars think that this is a model, an idea that comes from uh, from someplace else. <clears throat> In fact, some scholars controversially say that the Passover Seder with its question and answer format is very much like a Greek college classroom, a Greek classroom. So anyway, all of that is to say there's an intersection going on here. And if we miss that, um, we are going to really be missing quite a bit. <clears throat> I love this photo uh, for one reason. Um, here, this is on the grounds of Capernaum in Galilee. Um, this is, we don't know where it came from. It is on the grounds. So they just have all of these 
loose pieces stacked in the corners. Um, but this is the top out of a capital. This would be on top of a stone column and it just sort of crowns the top. That's a capital. These are acanthus leaves. Um, this is a very classical style that you'll see all over the Greek and Roman world. I mean, this is standard stuff here. No one even needs to explain this if you've gone to any museum in the Mediterranean. But here, look what's odd. <clears throat> here, what I have is, 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 the, is, again, another menorah with its stand at the bottom. There, notice that, very Jewish. Here's an incense shovel that would have been present uh, at the temple to scoop up incense. Here is a shofar horn. Do you see it right there? Okay. So anyway, here you have a perfect example of Hellenistic integration with Judaism. <clears throat> now, the Jewish, might, the Jewish world was so large and so many Jews migrated around the Roman Empire that the Romans actually did recognize them as a significant minority, and they made exceptions for the Jews. Um, <clears throat> while other, remember I said last time that religious practice and political faithfulness, those two were connected in that world. So when other tribal cultures continued to worship their gods, um, the Romans viewed that as um, seditious, uh, threatening. They, they were not comfortable with that. But for the Jews, because they were living all over the Roman Empire, um, the Romans decided this is not threatening. These are people who ought to be recognized as free to uh, pursue their own religious interests. So <clears throat> Jews were, um, were exempt from that kind of thing. In fact, at the, Jewish, at, the, at the temple, the Jewish temple in Jerusalem, they did not give sacrifices for Caesar. So that alone is a remarkable thing. So in, in terms of they did not pray to their god or the gods, as the Romans would have said, for the emperor. Now, every other temple in the entire empire was doing this, but the Jews were not. So there is some respect there, <clears throat> as long as the Jewish uh, nation uh, and its people uh, stays uh, pacified. Now, <clears throat> if you were Jewish and you were living under Rome during this time, um, what would be some of your options? Uh, what kind of a life could you choose and your attitude about Rome is really going to affect uh, what you choose. This picture, by the way, is <clears throat> a new area which has been excavated uh, next to the Temple uh, Mount. This is this is all or goes all the way back to Herod the Great. All of these beautiful uh, margins on these stones. This has been underground for almost uh, two thousand years, and it's just been recently uncovered. This is the side of the temple. So what I want to ask now is, what would be your Jewish options? Uh, well, <clears throat> we can make uh, a, a list of these, and I think uh, a list eh, might be helpful. First of all, um, there were Jews who assimilated fully into the Roman world, to Hellenism. They felt entirely comfortable, and they were willing to move into this world, much like maybe an Indonesian that moves to the United States. Um, and decides to become American in every sense. They change their clothes. They'll try their best to bring use American English. They will uh, just change culturally in every way. We have evidence of this uh, with Judaism as well. <clears throat> um, you can look, uh, you can find Jewish synagogue remains. Hey, uh, I think we have to ask everyone to mute, okay? So that, because uh, we can hear voices in the background. So we have, um, uh, we have what's called the diaspora. The diaspora means a dispersion, like throwing things. So we have what's called a Jewish diaspora, Jews living all over the Western Mediterranean world. We also have a Jewish diaspora going East. Most people don't talk about this, but there are Jews building large communities in Babylon, building them. In. So many, many Jews. It is enormous. In fact, let me just give you this one notion. There are more Jews living outside of Judea, Israel, than there are living inside of Judea, Israel by the time of the New Testament. Let me say that again. There are more Jews outside than there are inside of Judea. Now, that's amazing. That shows you how fully they have assimilated into the rest of the Roman world. I, I put this picture up because this is from uh, Sardis. This is Western uh, Turkey, or they called it, we call it Anatolia. Anyway, it is a Jewish synagogue. 
And we have found Jewish synagogues all over the Roman Empire. <clears throat> so that's one choice. And when I, think, when I think about the life of Paul, the Apostle Paul, and I ask, well, who is this man? Um, this is the man who's living out in the diaspora. This is a man who understands how it is to swim in Roman culture. Now, here's it's an example of a passage which I think is kind of fascinating, but just simply look at uh, what Paul experiences. <clears throat> Paul, it says, now when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessaloniki or Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul went in, as was his custom, and for three weeks he argued with them from the scriptures. Now, this is interesting because here we have just a very simple piece of travel itinerary from the Apostle Paul. He is in northern Greece, or Macedonia, it's called. He happens to come to a very significant trading town, Thessaloniki, and there he finds a synagogue of the Jews. So this is an example of how much Jewish life is in all of these cities. I would suggest this to you. When Paul is on his missionary tours and he goes from city to city, um, Luke doesn't need to tell you this but he is moving into Jewish communities inside of all those Roman or Greek cities. He's moving inside of them, and they have a, a gathering. They have a, they have a synagogue gathering, and he knows exactly how to be welcomed. Okay, assimilation is your first option. The second option is that there were many Jews who said, we do not want to have anything to do with Hellenism, and they wanted the extreme opposite. They wanted to separate they wanted to separate, full separation. And so therefore, we have evidence of communities that stay in the Middle East, they stay in Judea, and they are uh, from the region right next to the settlement Qumran, where we have what we think are the Essenes living. It is down at the desert, on the Dead Sea. But what's interesting about Qumran is that we have now discovered their scrolls, which came out of these caves and some others. Um, so uh, the people who are living down here, they, they want to separate, pure, they want to remain pure, and they don't want to have anything to do with Hellenism. Um, uh, they even think that Jerusalem is so Hellenized, they don't want to have contact with Jerusalem. So they're actually building their own religious community down here. It's really amazing. So anyway, so we have separation as an example of that. <clears throat> now, many, many people look at the life of John the Baptist and they say, okay, well, John the Baptist is baptizing down on the Jordan River, the Jordan River. And therefore they wonder, did the people of Qumran know John the Baptist? Did he come from that community? These are questions that people have asked for years. But look at the opening of Mark's gospel here. <clears throat> the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, who shall prepare thy way. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Now that phrase in verse 3, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, was the motto of the people at Qumran. They were going to go out into the wilderness, and they were going to be crying out, prepare the way of the Lord. So they are preparing for the Lord out there in the desert. So John the Baptist, John the baptizer, he appears, where does he appear? In the wilderness. Who's in the wilderness? It's the Qumran community. So therefore, John the Baptist, he's not terribly sympathetic with the leadership of Jerusalem. He actually calls them out for repentance. That is actually what you, that's the instinct that you would find in a place like uh, Qumran. Okay, so there's assimilation, all right, I understand that. There is separation um, for people who don't want Hellenism, and then, of course, there is full resistance. Now, <clears throat> in every society, there are those people who say, I cannot tolerate this foreign culture, this foreign occupation, these foreign politics, and I am going to use violence. So we do know that there is full resistance against Rome taking place during this period, uh, they're inspired by the success of the rebellion against the Greeks 200 years earlier. So therefore, rebellion is in the wind. You, you know this. The, one of the things that they're talking about constantly is the taxes the Romans are, are, are putting on the Jewish people and all people. 
because it's the tax revenue that comes out of the province that pays for the occupation and funds the empire. So um, there were many groups that came along that um, were messianic. Um, they said, the leader might say that I am the Messiah and I'm going to be leading you like the Maccabees uh, to our victory. One group that we do know about were called the Zealots. And the Zealots were people who um, began around 86 and their aim was to stop uh, the Roman occupation. And especially it was all about taxes. Now, this is, a, here's, a, here's a text which gives an excellent example of this story. Matthew 22, uh, there's a story about Jesus who is uh, approached by some of these people. Tell us then, what do you think, Jesus, taxes to Caesar or not? Now, uh, should we send money to Jakarta because I have to pay my income tax? No, 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 no. In a culture where you have political occupation and violence, you must speak in code. You must be careful the way you say things. So this really is a question that says, Jesus, do you support the occupation? Do you support the resistance? Are you with us? But Jesus, aware of their malice, said, why put me to the test, you hypocrites? Show me a coin for the tax. And they brought him a denarius. Here you can see a silver denarius from Rome. And Jesus said to them, whose likeness and inscription is this? And they said, Caesar's. Therefore, Jesus says, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. Very famous response. But let me now decode his response. The question to him is, Jesus, will you and your followers support the tax rebellion? Jesus' answer is, gentlemen, I appreciate your interest. But no, I am not supporting your tax rebellion. My kingdom is not in the business of political insurrection. So therefore, um, there, therefore, behind the scenes, there is, we know this is actually happening. One of Jesus uh, is to one of these groups. Um, the other, it's hard to know how to describe this. I call it integration. There are people who also are living in Judea who cautiously integrate. They want to retain their Jewish identity, but at the same time, they realize that the winds have changed and they need to at least embrace participation in this world. Um, I would describe the Jewish royal families in Jerusalem as exactly that. They're still in Jerusalem, they're stakeholders in the city and the politics there, but they recognize they're going to make friends with the Romans, they're going to make friends with uh, uh, the, the politics of that day. Um, <clears throat> the Sadducees, the party actually, um, from that period, um, who were made up mainly of joy, Jewish royal families. Um, and so therefore they have a stake. They're stakeholders in the success of the province. They want the province to be Jewish, but they know that there's no sense in fighting against the Romans. Um, we also know about another group that is allied with, uh, with the dynasty, the Herodian dynasty. They're called the Herodians. And so um, we know that people are figuring out how to live alongside of an occupation. To a certain extent, I think Paul probably fits into this category. Um, Paul is on the one hand holding on to his Jewish identity. Um, he comes from a family of Pharisees. He himself is a Pharisee. Um, he is conservative. He is orthodox. Uh, he's devoted to Jerusalem. He studies in Jerusalem. Yet at the same time, he grows up in the diaspora in Tarsus. Um, he speaks fluent Greek. He's comfortable traveling all over the Roman Empire. And so it makes you think, well, okay, so Paul is somebody who is wearing two hats. He is able to live in both of these. Um, notice how he has to play this out when he goes to, uh, uh, he, when he's in front of an audience uh, here. I think this one is in uh, Jerusalem. Paul was about to be brought to the barracks and he said to the tribune, may I say something to you? He said, do you know, and, and the uh, tribune, the Roman soldier says, do you know Greek? Are you not the Egyptian who was recently stirring up a revolt and led 4,000 men of the assassins out into the wilderness? So the Romans right away are thinking, oh, they're confused. They think, oh, the apostle Paul, we got this guy who's caused trouble in Jerusalem. And they don't even know he could speak Greek. 
and they're thinking that he is one of those rebels, some Jewish Egyptian guy who has 4,000 followers. And Paul has to say, whoa, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Verse 39, I'm a Jew. I'm from Tarsus in Cilicia. I'm a citizen of no mean city. That means I'm a citizen of an important city. I carry Roman citizenship. I beg you, let me speak to the people. So what Paul is saying to the Romans is, look, I'm a Jew, I get that, but also I'm a Roman citizen, hands off. And when he had given him leave, Paul was standing on the steps and he motioned with his hand to the people. And when there was a great hush, he spoke to them in the, notice it, Hebrew language. So Paul is fully bicultural. He looks at the Roman and he says, look, I'm on your team. (laughs) I come from Tarsus. And then he goes to the Jewish crowd and he speaks in Hebrew. It's very impressive. Now, there are other people who are living inside of this world and they actually experience what I kind of, not integration, but they're a step further away from the Romans. I call it disengagement. Um, They want to live more isolated. Um, uh, They're okay with living a life that doesn't even refer to the Romans. They're okay with that. Um, They have theological objections. They think that the Holy Land belongs to the Jews. And so they have a hope. They have a hope that the Messiah is going to come and the Messiah is going to deliver the land from these Romans. Uh, They're not willing to take up a sword. They're not willing to become Greek, but they're willing to remain Jewish and hunker down and hold on. Um, the Pharisees are very much like this. <clears throat> they, they're they active in the villages all over the country. Um, they're active in Jerusalem. And yet what they are doing is promoting cultural and religious Judaism. Um, in many cases, urging people to separate and be cautious of the Hellenistic world. To a certain extent, you might say Jesus of Nazareth comes from this world. Um, he is among what we call the Anawim. The Anoim in Hebrew simply means the poor. Um, he is from a village, uh, Nazareth, a very, very small village. He, he bases himself in Capernaum, another small village. But notice something interesting about Jesus. He does not, we don't have any record of him going to the major cities. We know what the major cities are. Caesarea, uh, Scathopolis. Um, these are the major Hellenistic cities in the region. Apparently, Jesus doesn't go to them. They are highly Hellenized. Think about this for a moment. Jesus never travels outside of Judea. He makes one trip up to Phoenicia. We know that. But he never goes to Syria. He never goes to Damascus. He never goes east to the Jordanian deserts, to Arabia. He doesn't go down to Egypt. What is that? He doesn't get on a ship and ever go across the Mediterranean. In other words, he stays in his geographical locale. This is that person I'm talking about. Now, what what that means is he has very little contact with the Romans. He, he, he is respectful, and he refers to the Romans respectfully, but <clears throat> he has no real contact with them, per se. There's one <clears throat> last category, and I think every country in the world has this category, and uh, these are what I would call uh, the poor, the peasantry, the Anawim. Um, and here, um, I think this is what I'm suggesting to you. Jesus is a part of this community. For many of these people, the survival is on their mind. Uh, It isn't political aspirations. It is simply survival. Look at the Lord's Prayer now, thinking about these people. Our Father, holy be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Now, I'll tell you the truth. When I am in uh, prosperous cities around the world, and I'm with fairly comfortable Christians, no one prays to God that I can eat today. But when I am in places where there is real poverty, you can hear that kind of prayer on a regular basis. Jesus is providing a prayer here for the Anawim. Forgive us our debts as we also forgive our debtors. Debt 
and debt collection are two of the primary concerns of these people. They're living on the very edge of starvation and still the tax collectors come around and what they want to do is collect money for the empire. And so therefore, um, how do I handle debt, okay? Uh, by the way, in Nazareth, there's a wonderful place I take my students all the time. It's an open air museum that reconstructs daily life in first century Judea. And uh, here's an example of the interior of a home. So all of this is to say there is real intersection going on. Jews uh, are resisting Hellenization. Um, sometimes they're uh, embracing uh, Hellenization, but nevertheless, um, they are absorbing Greek and Roman culture all of the time. Um, remember I used the analogy last week of uh, American culture, or no, I should say Western culture, and how Western culture simply moves around the world like a fog. And suddenly people who are living uh, in, uh, in places, you know, 10,000 10, miles away from uh, the West. Um, they're drinking Starbucks coffee and going to Pizza Hut and wearing Western clothes. And you think, how did all of this happen? And uh, today, uh, you, this is being, culture is being distributed by the internet, of course, and television and all of that. So this kind of, even though you want to resist this culture without realizing it, you're going to uh, absorb it. And it is just the nature of life. Okay, now, if I, I would like to just next talk about, well, all right, um, how does a Roman know that you're a Jew? <laughs> how, do, how, how is this? How does a Jew describe himself? If a Roman governor were to say, who are you? Um, a person might say, well, I'm Jewish. And the Roman governor, if he's poorly educated, would say, what is a Jew? What are the markers? What, how do I know? How do I set you apart? And I think we can reconstruct this. And I think it's really helpful for us because most of us don't think too much about it. <clears throat> um, one of the very first things that would come to mind is circumcision. Um, now, this is always an odd moment for me in every one of my classes. Um, I, I find that when I'm with college students and seminarians, um, all of the men sort of have this very odd look on their face and all of the women lean in because they want to know more about this. I think it's really hilarious. Um, circumcision was practiced in the Eastern Mediterranean uh, by the Jews. It was not practiced uh, by the Canaanites. It was practiced in Egypt and it is simply the surgical removal of a, a bit of skin, which is at the end of the penis. There we go. I think all of you are old enough. I'll just tell it like it is. This, by the way, is a really, really interesting uh, uh, depiction from Egypt of the earliest picture of circumcision going on, the absolutely earliest thing. Um, so anyway, what does it mean? This is, this is how a Jew identifies himself as bound to the covenant of Yahweh. This, uh, women were not circumcised, of course, um, men were. So therefore, circumcision doesn't belong to men necessarily. It belongs to Israel. It is a tribal marker, you might call it. Um, so therefore, it means that the males of the tribe are all marked and the women inherit the benefit of that identity because the women in this culture, it's patriarchal. So they're always attached to either to a male through marriage or birth. <clears throat> So therefore, it has cultural and religious significance simultaneously. The Romans did not appreciate this, nor did the Greeks. They thought it was barbaric. They thought it was something that uh, seemed ridiculous. But, but, but Jews found this to be really something important to them. In fact, um, for some Jews, listen to this, as Jews were Hellenized, um, the uh, Greeks and the Romans loved to have athletic events. And Believe it or not, at many of these athletic events, um, the men would practice, like in the wrestling events, uh, nude, no clothes. And so if a Jewish young man wanted to participate in a gymnasium of the Romans, he would have to be without clothes. And it would be obvious that he was circumcised. And that would lead to ridicule. So we know that there are, um, there are Jews in this period of time who are saying, maybe we should not circumcise our sons. That's a remarkable development. But circumcision is incredibly important. Now, it's so important, you can look at Paul's writing here in Ephesians 2, and actually they use this vocabulary. Now, look, look at Therefore, remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and called the uncircumcised 
by those who call themselves the circumcision, which is done in the body by human hands, remember that you at that time were separate from Christ, excluded from the citizenship of Israel. So even the Jews actually use this phrase, circumcision, uncircumcision, regularly to describe Gentiles and themselves. Um, it's, by the way, it's a really um, curious thing in uh, our culture. Um, we are very modest about talking about things like circumcision, uh, body parts, uh, women's menstrual periods. We don't, we don't, um, strangely enough, uh, we have taken those things and made them very private culturally. And so we don't talk about them. The Jews did, they talked about them openly. Um, when people in the Middle East actually visit the West, they say, you guys don't talk about things like circumcision, but you have so much sex in your media. How do you make that public? They don't make that public. All right, so that's one. Now, that's the main one I want to put up there for you. But there are certain things which we think there was wide agreement among Jews. I mean, Judaism is a, there is not one Judaism. There are many, many varieties, just like Christians are today. But we probably can come down to a group of values which all of the Jews would have recognized, okay? Uh, so here I call this cluster A. By the way, this is a really cool uh, uh, amateur menorah. Can you see that? That was found in a water drainage channel in Jerusalem, and uh, it's really sweet. This is just graffiti is all it is. So what are the things that the Jews are, uh, this is what would be common. First of all, Sabbath. How, how do you recognize Sabbath as a day of rest? All of the Romans recognize Jews as known for two things, circumcision and Sabbath. So Sabbath rest, yes. Diet, yes. Dietary restrictions continue to be practiced by even among those who are more Hellenistic. Yeah. The Torah, um, but that's the, the, the Old Testament, but it, well, it is the first five books, but it's all of your Hebrew scriptures. The, the debate is, how do you read it? Do you read it in Hebrew or can you read the Septuagint? Um, the temple is another. Um, everybody seemed to agree that the temple was vital inside of Jerusalem. And even if I lived in the diaspora, I would go on pilgrimage to that temple. And so the question, the debate is, is it obligatory? No one ever asked, is the temple important? And then land. That because Judaism is a tribal uh, religion, it is tribal society, they saw themselves as located in a particular land. Now, the question is, are you going to be political and fight for that land against the Romans? But no one would dispute that this land is important. But here is, and we'll take a break uh, after maybe I get through a, a one or more slide. Okay, well, I'm, I've got my eye on the clock. Um, this is what I call cluster B. And this is these are values about which <clears throat> there is some disagreement, all right? Now, uh, clothing is uh, an example of this. Do In many cultures in the world, you're expected to dress, you signal your culture, your tribe, by how you dress. Mm. And uh, I, it's, it's very widespread wherever you go in the world. Um, not so much uh, in the Western world, although I would contend that all of my students are signaling things by their clothes all of the time. Now, uh, look at this picture. This is crazy. This is amazing. This is the earliest depiction of Jewish clothing that we possess. It's from roughly 8200. It's from northern Syria on the Euphrates River in a place called Dura Europus. Um, and uh, today it's in the National Museum of Damascus. Now, what is going on here? Now, on the one hand, I can see this stripe that is very much Jewish. I get that. But the whole thing is set up like a Roman toga. And guess who this is supposed to be? This is Moses. Moses dressed like a Roman. That is hilarious. So you can see here that the people, the Jews living in Dura Europus, those Jews, when they began to make pictures of their, I don't know, their story, you might say, they were simply dressing these characters in Roman garb. That tells me that the Jews in Dura Europus were probably dressing just like Romans. Language is another. Um, what is going to be your native speech? Are you going to teach your children Hebrew or not? Are you going to, do you believe that you should read the scriptures in Hebrew? Is, is Hebrew God's language? Or are you willing to move into Greek or later into Latin? Where do you live? Are you obligated to live in the Holy Land? 
Are you obligated or are you free to go out and live elsewhere in the diaspora? Um, separation. Gentile contact. Can you have contact with Gentiles or you cannot have contact with Gentiles? There's a debate about that. Gentile contact, will it make you unclean? And lastly, nation. Should you devote your money, your life, your effort um, to building a Jewish nation or um, should you just simply let that go and realize that Judaism is perhaps a culture without a nation? What about political resistance? Oh, all of that is there. All right, here's my last slide, then we'll take a break. <clears throat> you can see that conservative Jews uh, in this period of time around the New Testament are complaining about this. The Greeks had placed in power someone named Jason, and he was bringing everyone over to the Greek way of life. Look at this. This is in the Apocrypha, 2 Maccabees chapter 4. Jason set aside the existing royal concessions for the Jews, secured through John, the father of Eupolemus, who went on the mission to establish friendship with the alliance. So Jason destroyed the lawful ways of living, introduced new customs contrary to the law. He took delight in establishing a gymnasium right under the temple area. So get this. So this guy was so Hellenized, Jason, leading Jerusalem, that he built an athletic center right next to the temple. He induced, he inspired the noblest of the young men to wear the Greek hat. Remember last week I showed you what a Greek hat was? Had a stiff rim around the top. There was such an extreme form of Hellenization and the adoption of foreign ways that this was the wickedness of Jason. Despising the sanctuary and neglecting the sacrifices, they hurried to take part in the wrestling arena, the discus throwing. Uh, you get the idea. They were chasing Greek forms of prestige. So I know from Jewish literature that there is this assimilation going on, and yet they're trying to hold on to their Jewish ways as well. Okay, I'm watching the time, and I think this is a great place uh, for us to stop, pause, and I think uh, field some questions, okay? <clears throat> okay, thank you again, uh, Professor, for your stimulating. You bring us back 2,000 years ago, <laughs> okay? So yep. allow me also to greet our brothers and sisters because I greeted uh, before at the beginning for uh, Indonesians who live in Indonesia, and we have diaspora here as well, Professor. So uh, got a information that uh, we have brothers and sisters from uh, Singapore, all right, and also from Taiwan, and oh, also wonderful. Seattle, all right. <laughs> okay, so uh, I mean, we also uh, have diaspora in Indonesia. Okay, so yeah. question number one, Professor. Uh, sorry, I will. Okay, yeah. A quick question. Uh, probably uh, the question is to have a sharp, a sharpened uh, uh, explanation and understanding from you. Uh, what is the difference between assimilation and integration? Right. Um, so, what I'm distinct think this is a good question. By assimilation, you are moving closer to uh, your new host culture. So therefore you are adopting quite a bit more. Integration means, for me, um, it means you are standing back and holding on to a great deal more inside of your culture. So if you're a Jew living in Jerusalem and you are speaking Greek and you're reading the Septuagint um, and you, yet you are faithful to the temple you are, you, are, you are creating this very delicate integration of one with the other. Assimilation means you almost disappear. So that Indonesian person who would come to Los Angeles, and then in one generation, you would not even know that they're Indonesian any longer. Um, that would be full assimilation. Okay. okay, thank you. Okay. Now the question, uh, I'll try my best because this is in uh, Bahasa Indonesia. Uh, it's about the, uh, the passage that you touched uh, in your lecture. It's about the paying tax, right? Yes. So yep. uh, the question is, uh, uh, did, oh, sorry. Uh, what Jesus did when he was asked about the tax, can it be, concluded that the Christians or 
it is about now. The Christians cannot be involved directly in uh, political things or also uh, political revolution, including for the uh, uh, dictatorship of the of the government. All right. Uh, the, the, the next question is: uh, Aren't we as Christians also involved? Yeah, I mean, should should we as Christians also be involved? Uh, to the culture that uh, uh, for the time being we are facing and uh, we convert or transform that uh, 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 that culture which is not good including by by involving in the uh, political you know in the practice i think i know what, what, what this is so it's it's important for us to make sure we don't say more than the scriptures say that's a really important value to all of us. Um, so what I know about this passage is that Jesus is looking at the zealot uprising. I think it's the zealot uprising, the tax rebellion. It's very, very violent, very violent. And he says, I'm, I'm not going to participate in that uprising. So for Jesus, the kingdom that he is establishing is not to be confused with a political uprising, period. Okay, I understand that. Um, it has been a widely debated theological question over the centuries about whether or not Christians should be pacifists uh, because of a passage such as this. And honestly, Christians have been divided. Um, it strikes me though that um, the majority of Christians, it seems to me, I'm just speculating here, have been reluctant to step into violent political causes because um, so often um, the violence seems worse in the uprising than the violence that had been there in the first place. So Christians have been reluctant to step into that. So um, the, the more general question would be, um, does this mean that Christians should not resist when they are um, confronted with corruption or political violence? No, I, th I think that we have to stand for what is right and just um, this is exactly what the prophets of the Old Testament did, um, and, uh, and, but we have to realize that there will be consequences that are going to come with that as well. So I, I personally think that, yeah, I mean, when Jesus goes to Jerusalem and finally at the end of his life and he cleanses the temple, he is showing public resistance to what he sees as the corruption of the politics of Jerusalem. Um, and yet that costs him his life because he was arrested for that. So... Um, this is a very difficult question. It really is. Um, I think it's better for Christians, in my mind, to say um, we can prayerfully, thoughtfully um, engage in nonviolent resistance. Um, um, but you have to be very, very careful when you cross that line. Thank you. Okay, next question. Uh, it touched again, uh, Luke 2, uh, when Jesus exhibited his excellent knowledge of scripture in the temple. Right. Uh, do you know where, when, to whom, how, you know, could he yeah. learn about it? Or did it happen miraculously since he is the son of God? Or was? <laughs> <laughs> right. So this, this story about Jesus in the temple as a young man is a really important story um, because Luke is actually telling us something, uh, two things that have to be in mind. First of all, Jews had education for their, I hate to tell you this, young women, for their young men <laughs> early on. So, so literacy was a value because they are a people of the book. And so this is one of the advantages they have culturally. They do teach literacy to the young men. Anyway, so Jesus would have been um, instructed by his father in um, the Hebrew scriptures from the time of five or six years old. He learned how to read using the, the Torah. Okay. Now, what happens is, um, is that the age of, uh, of, of 12 is, is sort of the culmination of your adult, you might call it your childhood. You might think about that that way. And so therefore the expectation was, is that at 13, you now become a young man or a person who is responsible for what you have learned. You are re a responsible agent inside of Israel. Um, it is a great ceremony in Jerusalem today um, at the temple area. Uh, so the young man uh, is put on the shoulders of his uh, father, and then he holds an enormous uh, Torah scroll, and they dance around him because now he has stepped into true membership. Okay, 
So Jesus would have been taught these things all the way, all the way up through his life. He'd just gone to synagogue all the way up through his life. And so the, here's the interesting part, is that his insight, his capacity to know the scriptures is greater than the people who teach the scriptures, and he has not even crossed that threshold yet. So you might say that, yeah, this is a signal of, of, of the work of God inside of his own life, um, but you also, it's okay to say that Jesus had a normal childhood, and yet he was a brilliant child. Make sure that you keep Jesus human. Make sure that you keep Jesus human and not simply have him be a supernatural child walking on the earth. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, next question. Uh, hello, Professor. Uh, could you explain, based on the classification on their response, I mean, the Jewish response to the Hellenism, which people uh, are easier to receive Jesus as their Messiah? In other words, how this Hellenism or maybe Greek or Roman can influence evangelism success? to the Jewish, thank you. Oh, that's a really, really good question. That's a brilliant question that I can take a couple of ways. So let's try this out. I'll have to think out loud with each of you. Um, <clears throat> on the one hand, you know, Jesus' earliest following, uh, right up through the early book of Acts, um, these are Jewish followers of Jesus because they, they actually have a category in their hearts that is ready-made to receive Jesus, and that is the Messiah. So they understand that fully. So um, I think there's real receptivity to that. But those people who were bringing the Jews into the church, who were converting the Jews, were themselves Jews. And that is really important to remember. On the other hand, when Paul goes into the Gentile world, um, Paul is commissioned at his uh, conversion um, to go to the Gentiles. He is able to, you might say, convert the message of the gospel into language a Gentile would understand. And so the conversions were actually greater in the Gentile world because the Gentile world was so enormous. It was so large. So it's, it depends on where you stand. If you're in Galilee, you're going to say, well, all of these, the, the, poor, the poor who are living in Galilee see the gospel as incredibly good news. The Jewish rich in Jerusalem see the gospel as threatening because it might upset all of the privileges they enjoy. Now, the question is, you asked the question about today evangelizing the Jews. I, I have a very personal view of this because I have been in Israel so much. I'm there constantly, and um, I know a lot of Jewish people. I, I think that Gentiles have difficulty sharing the gospel with a devout Jew. If the Jew is secularized or Hellenized, if the Jew is so westernized or assimilated into another culture, that's absolutely fine. But the most successful uh, preaching of the gospel uh, to Orthodox Jews, conservative Jews, come from Jewish Christians, like Jews for Jesus. They actually know what things will not offend. They know how to build those bridges. And so for me, when I think about my own conversations with my Jewish friends, um, uh, I really leave evangelizing to my Jewish uh, Christian friends. I do. The history of Jewish Christian conflict has been so enormous over the centuries that um, I'm, I'm willing to just simply say, you know, the greatest, I'll, I want to pray for my Messianic Jewish, my Jewish Christian friends, and they, they can take up that task. Thank you. Uh, next question. Uh, again, uh, brothers and sisters, you are able to uh, send questions to Joe slash Q&A. So quick question, uh, but short, do you have any historical notes about baptism ritual during that period? Oh, okay. sure. Um, well, that, yeah. Okay. So, the word baptism Greek simply means to dip, okay? And um, I'm, in the next, I'll talk to you about Jewish uh, ritual washing, but um, I can't provide for you notes about baptism properly before the New Testament, of course, but I know that baptism is standing on the shoulders of a Jewish ritual. So therefore, I can tell you all about what Jews were doing with water in immersing people in water. 
And so the John the Baptist and the Christians take that ceremony and convert it into a new meaning. Okay. And in the next uh, hour, I'll, I'll, I'll show you some pictures and show you how that works. Okay. All right. Ancient brothers and sisters. Now, this one is very uh, interesting for me uh, because you make uh, categorization about the how the Jewish respond uh, to the uh, Hellenization. So the question is, can we conclude that Jesus and most of all his disciple, disciples uh, are disengaged, I mean, the, uh, disengaged category? Um, I think his original group, um, probably uh, they were from what I would call uh, rural Galilee. Um, they're from the villages. They come from the Anawim. And therefore, their contact with the Romans is far less than anyone else. If you're from Jerusalem, you'll have a lot of contact. Or if you're from a Hellenistic city. So, um, yeah, I, I, don't, I, I think that there, there is considerable uh, separation there. Uh, uh, Carlo, what was the other part of the question? There is separation. Uh, sorry? Uh, I mean, the question is uh, probably like this. Uh, what category can you put Jesus and his disciples from? Yeah, yeah right. So I, I would say that they are having minimal contact. With, with the Romans at this time, but it's a respectful contact. I think, I think what is on, on Jesus' mind, um, and this is, happens for the church throughout the centuries, um, when the church, when Christians, um, it's easy for um, the kingdom of God to be confused with the kingdoms of this world. Does that make sense? It's easy for the kingdom of God to be confused with the kingdoms of this world. This was part of Jesus' own temptation. He's shown the kingdoms of the world, and he's asked, well, if you fall down and worship Satan, then you're going to be able to get all of these things. The church has always asked itself, well, okay, um, I need to have a respectful engagement with, with those who are in political control, but when my own efforts as a follower of Christ get confused with politics, politics always wins the day. The church has always regretted it when it has aligned itself with nationalism or politics or something like that. So for Jesus, I, I see him actually having a respectful but separated relationship from the Romans. Okay. Can, can he be... Uh, put as the, I mean, you mentioned about the assimilate or integrate. Can we put uh, Jesus and his gospel to that club or uh, for the separation or disengage? Um, for me, I, I, for me, I see a lot more separation. I do. Um, I do. I se separation. And I, I, if you want to call that integration, it's a very cautious integration. Um, he is more like the Pharisees. Um, do not misrepresent the Pharisees. The Pharisee, all of you would be Pharisees, probably. Carla would be a great Pharisee. <laughs> Why is um, that? Why so? Well, yeah, we stereotype the Pharisees, um, and it's wrong. The Pharisees love God. They believe in the Messiah. They study their scriptures. They believe in the Holy Spirit. They believe in life after death, eternal life. They have a gospel they want to preach, right? Jesus is debating them all the time because he's like them. They're the ones who come and want to talk to him. They're the ones that want to have that engagement. Now, of course, the gospels present the Pharisees as critical and all of that. And you know, so that's why we... But the apostle Paul was a Pharisee, right? So we know that Pharisees follow Jesus. So anyway, the Pharisees. So Jesus is like the Pharisees in the sense that all of the, the raw materials of his spiritual life are like the Pharisees, except the Pharisees don't have one thing. <laughs> they have to decide if the Messiah has come. <laughs> okay. yeah. So take, take that home with you. you. We're all Pharisees in this room. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, because we had a session with, uh, with uh, Dr. Craig Evans uh, about the yeah. uh, Death Scrolls, and yeah. that, that separates uh, like Jesus and the uh, Qumran, because some Qumran, the Qumran people, the Essenes, are the uh, uh, separated, separated. Oh, separated. Yeah, totally. Okay. Jesus is not like Qumran. No, he's not like Qumran. Okay. 
All right, uh, we come to the first session. Very good, uh, brothers and sisters. Uh, keep uh, raising your questions, but we need to go to a break. Uh, before we go to break, we uh, I'm asked by committee to ask the uh, uh, all brothers and sisters to activate your cameras, please, because we want to take a picture so that we have an archive, you know, documentation for the committee. Uh, Othniel, would you mind uh, taking pictures very quickly? And I, I, I will ask uh, brothers and sisters to cheer up, you know. Uh, okay, Othniel, uh, let us know when you take the picture. Please activate your cameras, brothers and sisters. So that, Othniel? Okay, uh, see, yeah, I, I'm seeing that most of us are activating uh, the cameras, yes. Okay, uh, I'll uh, wait for another 15 seconds <laughs> so that uh, uh, to make sure that we are all covered. Very good, fantastic. Okay, uh, we will have a break. Uh, for uh, yeah, seven to 10 minutes, I'll be back and see you and stay tuned, brothers and sisters. Thank you. Okay, now uh, we will go back to the lecture of Professor Gary Emberich. Thank you. All right, well, welcome back everyone. <clears throat> I just put a message up in chat saying how impressed I am that you guys are doing this uh, at night. I'm wondering if American students would have the same kind of strength as you do. But <clears throat> so congratulations on uh, your investment. Um, I'm assuming this, Carlo, do a really quick check. You can hear me, you can see me. Yes, we can hear you, Dr. Birch. Okay, and see the slide, right? Yes, yes, we can see it clearly. <laughs> All right, excellent. So um, here is what we're doing. We're asking ourselves, if you were a Jewish and you were living in this time, <clears throat> what would be the most uh, common things where you would define yourself? And I gave you circumcision as the first, and then an, a cluster A is an agreed upon set of items, and then some discussion, some debate about another set of items. And so what I'm doing now is just sort of giving you some what I think are important images, which are a vital part of our understanding. Purification is also on this list. Um, we don't know exactly why or how this happened, but in about 200 years before Jesus, maybe 150 years before Jesus, um, uh, Judaism became really concerned about uh, uh, ritual purity. Um, who's clean, who is unclean. The language of clean and unclean is everywhere in the literature of Judaism at this time. And it continues all the way up through roughly AD 150 or so, and remnants of it continue. But there's an obsession during this period of time. And they're, they're, they're concerned about how we might be defiled. Um, how is it that I might become impure? And, and so therefore here, I have listed for you uh, four of the, of the most uh, well-known, the most well-known, there are many others, but these are the main four categories, uh, bodily discharges, um, uh, corpse impurity, skin disease, and Gentile contact. And if you have contact with any of these things, what you'll have to do is that evening go through a ritual bathing process so um, I can actually look at each of these four and give you an examples from the New Testament where you actually have this kind of thing at work. Um, <clears throat> bodily discharges, when the woman with a hemorrhage of blood in Mark chapter five comes and touches Jesus' garment hem, um, it says she's been bleeding for 12 years. We think this is vaginal bleeding, possibly cervical cancer. We don't know exactly, but the whole point is that menstrual blood is something that will uh, defile. Um, and so by defile, it doesn't mean it means you're unclean uh, as uh, hygienically. This is not about hygiene. This is not about dirty. This is about um, something uh, sacred. You have touched something sacred that is off limits. Life is in blood and therefore blood is sacred. Um, corpse impurity, cemeteries, skin disease, leprosy, Gentile contact. Now, so this means that <clears throat> you can discover 
all over uh, Israel from the this period of time, these ritual baths. Now this, I'm showing you a, a good one that's in very good repair. Um, I believe this one is outside of Jerusalem on the south side of the city, but there are rules about what kind of water. Ignore this. This is just uh, dirty, <laughs> um, but this would have a covering over it, and you would go down on one side. You'd have no clothes on. You would immerse yourself in the water, and you come up the other side. This is not about washing at all. This is about impurity and reclaiming your status with God. Um, it's immersion. It's an immersion bath, and uh, the people at Qumran were doing it daily. Um, so if you were in a status of unclean, you had to go through this. Some people think that Jews lived in a status of unclean for much of their lives. You, you couldn't avoid being unclean sometimes. If a person dies, you have to take care of their body and bury them, okay? So anyway, so this we think is the origin of baptism. In other words, a Christian baptism is not simply going through a ritual of being made clean from an impurity. It is something that inaugurates you into the kingdom of heaven. Now, because Mark, for instance, does thinks you don't understand these things, um, he is happy to explain them to you. And Mark 7 is some of the evidence we have about this explanation. When the Pharisees gathered together with him, some of his scribes came from Jerusalem. They saw that some of his disciples ate with hands defiled. That means they were not doing ritual washing before they were eating. <clears throat> the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat. Uh, we have to make sure everybody is muted, okay? So uh, we're all we're hearing everyone's sounds. Um, verse 4, and when they come from the marketplace, um, they do not eat unless they purify themselves and there are many other traditions which they observe, like the washing of cups of pots and vessels and bronze. So they're always concerned that somehow impurity is, is almost like a virus that can move from person to person, and it can have an effect on you. And it has to be corrected constantly. The other item that would have been known well among Jews in this period is Shabbat or Sabbath. <clears throat> um, the Romans recognized this as a very unusual Jewish practice. Um, you know, one of the reasons they identify it so closely is because when Jews entered the Roman military, they, many were reluctant to fight on Shabbat. So therefore, what this, uh, this identity with Sabbath is so deep, so strong that there is extensive Jewish lawmaking about it. You're not to work on the Sabbath, but, you know, what is work? And so therefore, um, how far can you walk? How many pounds can you carry? Um, how many chores can you do before you've worked? Can you prepare food? That kind of thing. Um, and so not only is there is this, this commitment to um, resting on the Sabbath, but now there is what they call the tradition of the elders, the oral law, which keeps you away from violating Shabbat. By the way, I, I found this wonderful mosaic. Here is Shabbat here in Hebrew, and it is in the Jewish quarter of um, the old city of Jerusalem. All right. Now, here you can see this debate about how close you can get to violating Sabbath is, is everywhere in the Gospels. Um, Jesus went from there and he entered a synagogue and behold, there was a man with a withered hand. And they asked him, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath so that they might accuse him? Now, what is behind that sentence, that question is this. <clears throat> there were permitted activities on the Sabbath and there were other activities that were not permitted. For instance, you can save a life on the Sabbath. You can do something to save your animal if it's going to die. But if it actually is simply injured, you can wait until the next day. So therefore, they're wondering, Jesus is known as a healer. Will he heal? Is healing acceptable work on the Sabbath? So he said to them, what man of you, if he has one sheep and falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will not lay hold of it and lift him out? So there he's saying, look, the truth is, you know, it isn't just that you would want to save the sheep's life, but you really are going to take care of that sheep and you will pull him out, won't you? How much more value is a man than a sheep? So it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. So he said to the man, stretch out your hand. The man stretched it out and it was restored. So what you can see is that Jesus is actually respecting the Sabbath. But what he's saying is that we have not been generous with our spiritual rules. And he's willing to violate those things. And we have many stories of those violations. Every Jew would also understand that they have a festival system, which is annual. <clears throat> 
And um, there are, you're always in a festival inside of Judaism. They all have symbols. Um, they're all important, really, but there are four that I want to underscore for you. Um, first of all, keep in mind that Sabbath, Shabbat, is actually a festival. It is a weekly festival. It isn't a, uh, yeah, it is a regular festival, weekly, but we forget sometimes that it has the same festival status every seventh day. But there are three main festivals. They are pilgrimage festivals that will uh, that require some activity of the Jew. If you're living in a village, you need to come to Jerusalem, you need to sacrifice, you need to participate. We don't believe that everybody did this, but that is the ideal. So the, the religious or the, the season at the temple begins at Passover, Pasach at Passover, which commemorates both the history of, of the Jews leaving Egypt, of course, and the very beginning of the harvest. And then Shavuot, Pentecost, refers to the ending, the closure of the grain, the cereal harvest. Um, but it also reminds them of their wanderings, uh, their, uh, the time they wandered through the wilderness after they left Egypt, and then they came to Mount Sinai, and that is when the covenant was given. So the birth of the nation is remembered at Pentecost. Now, what's interesting about Pentecost is, you know, in Acts chapter 2, um, the Holy Spirit comes to the church on Pentecost. Well, um, if Pentecost remembers the birth of Israel at Mount Sinai, um, the Pentecost in Acts chapter 2 talks about the birth of the church when the Holy Spirit falls. So you can see that there are similarities here with all of this. Going back to Passover, Jesus dies on Passover, and of course, um, a lamb is sacrificed at Passover. So the Christian message, the Gospels, are always tying into these things. Uh, tabernacles, Sukkot, all of these things, uh, was another. See, the completion of the um, harvesting of tree and vine, you know, things like grapes and um, the pomegranates. And so, therefore, tabernacles uh, is your great closure to the harvest year. Now, all of these have got symbols, just like we as Christians have symbols inside of our faith, they do as well. So here you've got a mosaic from a, um, a synagogue floor uh, in Galilee. But here, this is a tabernacle's uh, lulav. I'll show one to you in a moment. Um, here is a shovel, and then here is a uh, shofar. It is a horn, a beautiful horn, that is to call you to prayer. So they have symbols that go with all of these, and the New Testament is talking about these symbols regularly. In uh, John's Gospel, chapter 8, when Jesus says, I am the light of the world, he is doing this at Tabernacles, and Tabernacles has built into it a light festival, which we can go into some other time. The other thing that would have been prominent in a Jewish thinking is the temple. And of course, you already know that the temple is a part of that list of things that every Jew recognized. But there is something going on at the temple in Jerusalem that you, you have to stop and acknowledge. It was under a full-blown reconstruction during Jesus' day. We think it began around 20 BC, and it continues for mm, roughly 80 years. Um, when Jesus arrives at the temple with his apostles uh, from Galilee, you know, in, in, in John chapter 2, the apostles immediately say, Master, look at these stones. Look how amazing this is. You remember that passage, I hope. What they're doing is they're acknowledging this reconstruction project. But the temple plays a lot of roles. Uh, this is first. This is this is a pos, This is political identity for Israel. This this temple shows that in some way we're still a theocracy. This is you might say the palace of God. This is where God meets His people. This is what identifies us as 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 a unique people in all of the earth. We have been chosen to be that place where God meets the world. So Israel's own national identity is they're proud of this temple. They're proud of the city of Jerusalem. They, they, they see this as one of the great cities even of the Hellenistic world. Now, there are passages written by Jewish rabbis. I love this one. I think it's in the Mishnah. It says, if you have not seen the temple in all of its glory, you have never seen a beautiful city in your entire life. That's amazing. That is written before the temple is destroyed in AD 70, but you can see their pride is there. 
But also, this is about theological identity. This is a place where I can learn, I can worship, I can sacrifice, and therefore this is a location where I can find reconciliation with God. Now, that means that the temple is central to all of my life as a Jew. It is central. I cannot understand this. You do not sacrifice in a synagogue. You only can sacrifice at the temple. And that is why you will go to the temple regularly on pilgrimage. Today, even, this is why so many Jews want to be near the ruins of the temple. It is that sacred. I brought with me some pictures that try to reconstruct this. This is looking from the north, but let me just identify for you some things that would be of interest. Here is the temple proper. Um, it is the holy place is in here. This is where the sacrifices took place in this area in front of these steps here. Here's the altar of sacrifice. Um, and then the women have their own area right here, the court of the women. By the way, you women should know this. <clears throat> in the court of the women, uh, the women could go here. They could not go into this area where the men were, the Israelite area, but they stayed here. And the treasury was right here in one of these corners. And the tabernacles, dancing and festival were all right in here. And it says in John 8 that Jesus was near the treasury, meaning he hangs out in the court of the women. The women go through here. The men go through here. And so therefore, by being in this court, Jesus is able to have contact with his follower or with, with, with his Jewish community. <clears throat> um, this huge, huge area right over here is um, a porch. It is a, a beautiful Roman uh, royal porch. I'll show you some reconstruction pictures in a moment, but this was all protected from the weather. And this is where Jesus would have debated with the, uh, with the Pharisees and the leaders of the temple. <clears throat> now there's a, a really wonderful um, uh, sort of computer generated reconstruction of Jerusalem at the University of California in Los Angeles. And what it's showing is if you were down at the south side of the city, this is the beauty of the temple. You can see it right here. Um, here's that beautiful royal porch I was just talking about sitting up here. Here's the southern gate to get into the city. Here's another step stair that gets you up into the city. We still have the remnants of this. There is the temple itself inside of that courtyard. And here's another, another archway here. Um, by the way, if you notice on that corner, this is a Roman fortress that goes back to a Jewish period, but it's now Roman and it is sitting here watching all of the activities inside. <clears throat> so as you were living here, um, you would actually enter the temple. You could enter this direction by going up this staircase here. Notice there are shops here. We have remnants of all this today in Jerusalem. So we can see this. This is that large royal porch that I was talking about. It had 160 columns, four rows with about 40 in each row. Um, and they each weighed nine tons. It was gigantic. This is where Jesus was debating with the Pharisees toward the end of his life. Okay, so we can see the temple is in Jerusalem. It is enormous, but at the same time, um, one development that is new to Judaism in this period is the synagogue. The synagogue is a public, it is a gathering house. That's what synagogue means, to call, to lead people together. It is a it is a gathering house is all it is. It's a place for teaching and prayer and discussion is what it is. And it originated during the exile because during the exile, the temple was gone, the Old Testament exile in Babylon. So what, how, do you, how do we gather as a people? We need to gather to hear the scriptures read, uh, to debate the issues of the day. So notice it does not, it is not directional. It has seating. Do you see the seating right here? Okay, so that was because they would sit around in a circle and debate. So imagine this is the kind of environment that Jesus would have been in. Um, but it served as a network for Jews all over the Roman Empire. We found synagogues were in every Jewish community everywhere. And after Jerusalem was destroyed by the Romans in AD 70, it is the synagogue that continues to uh, sustain Judaism all the way up until this present day. The synagogue was the domain of the Pharisees, not the Sadducees, not the Herodians, not the Zealots. It was the domain of the Pharisees because they felt that teaching and education was that important. Now, I thought I would show you, we have about a half dozen, about six of first century <clears throat> synagogues, which have been discovered. 
And they're so interesting. I thought I would just show them to you. Um, this is in Galilee. It's north of Capernaum. It's on this hill, this hilltop here. It was a town that was built on a hill, and they put a wall around it. But down inside, you can see the synagogue. Here, I'm showing it on the right. On the left, here's a close-up. Now, notice you can see they tried to reconstruct it as best they could. There were columns. You can see some column bases here. There are no... Of course, roof material is gone, um, but some of the seating is still there, you can see, and I'm sure there was more seating than this. That's what is that. So you can identify a first century synagogue fairly quickly, fairly easily. Outside of Bethlehem, there is a Roman fortress called the Herodium. It is uh, just looks like a volcano almost. But inside, they actually had a fort. Uh, this hill was all built up. And when you look inside, do you recognize it right there? there is a first century synagogue. So therefore you can see the stepped seating on the side, here are the column bases. Um, so we know that these are uh, everywhere. Up on the mountain of Masada where the Jews had their last stand, um, we actually have found the remains of a synagogue. Here's the mountain itself. Here's this area, this, uh, this a palace really that Herod built. Um, here at Matsada. But inside, you can see, here's they reconstructed a lot of it because it's used by Jewish families today, and they put some columns there. This is all artificial reconstruction, and there's a column top. So there we go. So you, you, I think you're getting the sense of it. Capernaum um, is really interesting. The Capernaum synagogue was completely rebuilt uh, about 200 years after Jesus. And so when you go and visit Capernaum, this is all um, from the third and fourth century. So it's all fairly new. That's what we think it looked like. But here is this uh, new building up here. But we can see here black basalt stone, and that is the floor of the synagogue of Capernaum. This is really fascinating because this is the floor on which Jesus stood when he uh, uh, cast out his first demon. He was in this synagogue many, many, many times. I thought I would also finally show you um, uh, what it looks like when you have a really a destroyed uh, synagogue. This is, we call this a robbed out site. This is, this is a palace that was built by Herod down in Jericho, and there is very little that remains. You can see something of the extent of the synagogue sitting right here. All we have are some rough walls around the perimeter. Very little is left, but there's one thing that they discovered that I think is incredibly cool. They've found a floor mosaic inside of the synagogue. You see it right here? It's fabulous. And here you can see the menorah with its stand. Here's a lulav, which you, is, is a plant that you shake. It's a bunch of plants that so you shake at tabernacles. And here's the shofar. You've seen that many times now. So all of that is to say, okay, so um, here, you know, um, there are... Jews who have their, their, their structures of life all built. And as Jesus and as Paul are moving through their world, they would have recognized these things. <clears throat> okay. Now we've sort of talked about what kind of buildings, what kind of places you would go, what kind of values you might have, circumcision, festivals, temple. But what I would like to know is what are the things that people believed? If you were a Jew living in this period of time, um, what are the things that would have been just native to you, instinctive? You would grow up as a child with these things. And the first is um, an unflinching commitment to one God. <clears throat> and this is the great Shema, um, Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 5. It is, you write it out, you uh, write it everywhere, you memorize it, you recite it regularly. Jesus recited this on a daily basis. Uh, hero Israel, the Lord our God is one God. In a world of polytheism, of many gods, that's an important statement. You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your might. Shema Israel, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. Vayahavde et Adonai Eloheka, bekol lavavka, uvekol nafsheka, uvekol meotaka. So every Jew knows this language. They recite it regularly. They even want it to be on their lips as they die. So that's clear. The other thing is, is that I understand that my life is to be led by the law. Um, it isn't necessarily legalistic, but instead, because God has been gracious to us, I want to obey him in response. 
So this is a mistake that Christians often make. Judaism is not necessarily legalistic. Don't go there. Think about it this way. God showed his grace to Israel by bringing them out of Egypt. They brought, he brought them for three months through the desert and then brought them to Mount Sinai and then gave them the tablets of the law. Here we have them. Okay. So consequently, you have to say, well, okay, the law isn't in order that you might be saved. The law is there so that you can appreciate um, your gratefulness for having been saved. Now, the law means this is how you organize your life. This is civil law and this is religious law, both baked in together. We don't have to talk about this any longer, but the temple is a part of your own life. You love the temple. You go to the temple. I can't say enough about the temple. The temple is so important to you. It really is. Um, these, by the way, are two gates on the south side of the Jerusalem temple wall, and these were entrance gates, which have now been closed up. <clears throat> All right, so I can see these are the things that I'm really committed to, but I'm also, I have an instinct for the land. The, the, the average Jewish person is, is, is grounded geographically. Um, many of us in the West don't have this idea, at least in my world. Muslims have the same idea. Jews have this idea that there is land that I belong to. There's land that my tribe belongs to that has given, been given to me. So therefore, um, the Holy Land is not incidental in my thinking. If I'm in living in the diaspora, I want to be buried in the Holy Land. I want to go back there. Some people, when they think about the things which uh, 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 the Jews would believe, they like to summarize it with three T's. And, and I think uh, I got this from a friend of mine that you have heard already, I think, Ben Witherington, a New Testament scholar. But I think this is really nice to know. Um, the three things that every Jew would just believe in instinctively, territory, Torah, and temple, the land, the law, and the Jerusalem temple, territory, Torah, and temple. And I think that's a very nice summary that gives us a, a, a sense of how I organize my thinking as, uh, as a Jew. Now, if you want to see these things at, absolutely at play, all you have to do is read the speech of Stephen in Acts uh, chapters uh, 7 and into 8, but Acts, mainly Acts chapter 6, 7, and 8, the story about Stephen. Stephen gives the longest speech in the book of Acts, and most of us don't understand it because we don't know these three pillars of Judaism. And you'll notice that he's giving commentary on all three of these when he is giving that speech. All right. Now, the other thing I wanted to point out to you is that, well, okay, so I've got these, 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 these commitments that definitely organize my life, but I also have a, a series of theological values. Now, it isn't just that I'm a monotheist, and that's why I say the Shema, but I believe something about my God that other tribal gods don't enjoy that the God of Israel is not just the God of Israel. The God of Israel is the God of the entire world. The Romans and the Greeks just haven't figured this out yet. And this God does not change. He does not change. So therefore, there is a sense of stability. And I don't have to explain this to you. It is something that I just understand in the, the core of my being, that, this, I, that one God controls and creates the entire universe. This is so assumed inside of the Bible that notice carefully, the Bible never gives arguments for the existence of God. You will look with futility for that. It is just isn't simply there uh, because no, no I, don't, I don't need to do that. The second theological idea that is, is driving my thinking as a Jew in this period is my thoughts about creation. <clears throat> And the audiences of Jesus just assume this as well. Um, not everybody agreed that the world is a good place, that the world, world was created to be good. I mean, you can just go around the world and look at natural disasters and wars and disease, and you could say to yourself, I'm not sure the world is such a good place. But Jews said it was, that the world is good. God's intentions were good. The God who made the world was not mean, not angry, not malevolent. He is good, and therefore he made a good world for us. 
So our scriptures begin with a picture of the Garden of Eden. Our Bible ends in the book of Revelation with images of the Garden of Eden. The problem, of course, is humanity. We bear the image of God. Now, this is huge. Humanity bears the image of God, but we have also broken the image of God. Now, this is important because this is the basis of Jewish ethics. Because how I treat everyone has got to be remember that everyone is bearing are, are the handiwork of God's. God's fingerprints are on everyone. So I carry something inside of me, which every human does. So humanity is good. But having said that, humanity is also corrupt. By the way, what I'm showing you here are a series of beautiful pictures of one of my favorite places in Galilee. It is a Jewish tomb system called Beit Sharim. And uh, it's from the period of Jesus until about 300 years after. Um, but you can see here, these are Jewish tombs, Jewish. But you can see that there are Roman and Greek images on all of them. So corruption. The Jews believe in real corruption. They believe in sinfulness. They're not naive. And they understand that humanity is truly broken. So they look at creation and they say the corruption of humanity has affected even all of creation itself. So the world, creation, is in disarray. Something is broken. And that means that the creation and humanity lives under God's holiness. God is holy. The world itself has become unholy. And therefore, judgment is a natural outgrowth of this, of this problem, this predicament. That means also Jews have a robust understanding of sin. Sin is not a casual category inside of Judaism. Sin means that you have actually chosen to do some really terrible things. You have been unfaithful to the covenant, unfaithful to God's law. You have not lived a righteous life, and therefore this must be corrected. And that means, therefore, you have to find a place of redemption. You have to find a way to find forgiveness. And the temple and its sacrificial system is a building a gesture of grace. This is God's way to place into the world an opportunity for us to restore a relationship with him. Now, what I'm doing here is simply outlining a Jewish theology. This is a theology that would have been understood by any Jew who was in a synagogue on a regular basis. He's been reading uh, these, these, these words on a regular basis. Now, God's redemptive solution to the world is to create a family, to create a family that would be a light and salt to the world. And so, therefore, he creates a covenant with the tribe of Israel. So, therefore, the average Jew would say, we have graciously received the love and redemption of God, but we are also supposed to go out and be a blessing to all nations. This is what Abraham was told way back in Genesis 15. It's not that just you're going to have all these descendants and land, but you have to bless the rest of the world. Israel is to be God's redeeming presence inside of the world. They receive grace, they live obedient lives, and they recognize they're chosen for a mission. That means they have hope. By the way, this is a tomb also. Notice um, these tombs don't always have rolling stones. This is a magnificent tomb still with its swinging doors. Can you see that? That is a beautiful tomb in Beit Sharim. So there is hope. There's an eschatology. The hope is that God is going to come into this world and restore all things. There is going to be a consummation, a finishing up of all things inside of this world. Now, the last thing that I want to just show you is that, okay, so I'm a Jew. I've got all of these from circumcision to temple to obedience. I have a theological framework that I live in, and I also have some reflexes. These are cultural reflexes that come deep inside of Judaism, and they show up again and again inside of our New Testament. For instance, I have, I have expectations about relationships. I'm Jewish, right? So therefore, I keep strong gender boundaries, boundaries between male and female. Therefore, females are to have contact only with their family males or their husbands. 
and children. So therefore, in John 4, when I read Jesus at a well, sitting at a well, alone with a woman he's not related to, you can imagine there's a scandal there. And that is why the apostles, when they return, they're wondering. Um, I have expectations about marriage. I know when you're supposed to be married. You're married in your late teens. I have arranged marriages. People don't fall in love and go get married. Instead, your parents arrange these things and you are married inside of your tribal structure. You're going to marry your second and third cousins. That's how you keep your property inside of the family. Now that's assumed for everyone. And that has raised questions about Jesus. Jesus is somebody who is not married. How did that happen? No arranged marriage? How is it? This idea of being a bachelor is very, very modern. We also have expectations for high and low. I mean, social class is something I recognize just as societies everywhere recognize. We send codes to each other from our clothing, to our wealth, to our education, to our speech. And so therefore, what is Jesus' social class? It's a very fair question. He comes from the bottom of the social ladder. He is among the peasantry, the Anawim. I also have a very strong sense of what we call, anthropologists call in-group and out-group. Um, I, I, I'm a tribe, and I believe there are people who belong inside and people who belong outside, and I build a boundary around this. It's a tribal consciousness. That's in Judaism. Therefore, I separate my tribe from everybody else as a Gentile. <laughs> They're the nations, the goyim. They are the Gentiles, but I have a wall built around me, Okay. So therefore, there are people inside of my tribe who don't belong there because they're not living rightly, and I'm willing to throw them out, but I keep this intact. Jesus and Paul are willing to break through this kind of thinking, and that really does change a lot. I also have this expectation. I know how my world is organized. Just like in Indonesia, you know you have a lot of islands, and somehow that probably figures into your view of the world. Um, but the world of Jesus and Paul are the same. I, we distinguish urban and rural. Um, in modern Western society, the urban setting is where a lot of the poor go, but not true. It's reversed in Jesus' society. The, the rural areas are where the poor are, and the urban areas in the walled cities is where the rich are. Notice that Jesus stays in the poor villages. His is a movement among the poor. I also have geography as an identifying marker for myself as well. Um, in America, you know, there's a difference if you're from Texas or if you're from Illinois. Um, I can tell by how you speak. The same thing is true in Jesus' world. Galilee versus Judea. They had an accent in Galilee. They have an accent in Judea. And in fact, people in Judea thought they were a little more special. There was a kind of cultural hierarchy there. I don't know, maybe you have that in Indonesia in the same way. They have an understanding of rich and poor. There's the peasantry and the peasantry are the poor and they live under this tax burden. And so therefore there are regular tax revolts going on inside of the country all through Jesus' life. Literacy is important to me as well. As I said to you earlier, Jews believe that literacy is significant because you can't read the scriptures. They had schools for children from the age of five and six. So children went to school all the way up to roughly the age of 12 or 13, and then it was understood that girls would be in an arranged marriage. They're not married yet, but it's all arranged, and they're simply living at home, and men, young men, would take on a trade from their father or from their extended family. Here's another criticism of Jesus. We know he begins as a carpenter, a builder, but he doesn't continue with that trade. He is single and tradeless. He is moving across the countryside, and that is why he is criticized. And I think this is the last one. There is also what I call spiritual practice. What I mean by this is, how do I conduct myself in relationship to God? I understand that my religious life and my religious rules coming out of the scriptures, they control public life. There's no public law apart from religious law. They are one and the same. Um, I, I regularly respect the temple, and I go as often as I can, and I go there especially on pilgrimage festivals. I don't celebrate Passover at home or in the synagogue. It has to be celebrated in Jerusalem, and so I, I like to do that whenever I can with my family. However, every week I go to the synagogue, 
This is a place of public gathering. And for many men, they met nightly inside of the synagogue or in homes to discuss theology. Jesus is meeting with men. In Luke chapter 7, he meets with a group of men having a meal together. It is hosted by Simon the Pharisee. It is a private men's gathering um, that we know about called a Havarim. But I view myself as a person of the book. I may not own a copy of the scriptures. I don't, I'm not wealthy enough for that, but I'm a person of the book. And I, and I, and I go to synagogue to hear the book read. Um, I'm a person of the temple. I worship at the temple and I, I, I love, I love my temple. So this is Hellenistic Judaism. This is a world that Jesus swims in. This is a world that Paul knows intimately. And when I read my New Testament and I know these values are at work inside of the audiences of the New Testament, suddenly my New Testament comes alive. Okay, thank you for your patience. Um, I wanted to make sure that we made it uh, there at that far. I'm going to discontinue my sharing right now, and I'm going to hand it back over to Carlo. Okay, Carlo? Yeah, thank you again, Professor. Uh, brothers and sisters, uh, it's 9 p.m. already, but uh, and also uh, we respect uh, brothers and sisters, especially in the eastern part of Indonesia and also the central part of Indonesia. Uh, it's already 11 uh, p.m. in the uh, eastern part of oh Indonesia. My that's why, no worries, uh, Professor. Uh, that's why we inform that probably we kind of extend 10 to 15 minutes for the quick Q&A. Uh, and then we will close in the prayer. Question, Professor. How does the Greco-Roman world of the New Testament influence and impact the Judeo-Christian worldview we see in Western culture today? How much is the influence? How much is the impact? And can we still see the lasting impact and legacy of the Greco-Roman world in our modern world today? That's a great question. Um, I'm only qualified to speak about the Western world, of course. So let me just, uh, yeah, let me just try this out. Um, there are legacies that come from Judaism that have actually moved all the way through into the Christian world because we carried in the Christian world the Jewish scriptures. So therefore, if you are inside of the West, if you believe in God, the assumption is, is that you will believe in one God. Monotheism is very, very common. You have an ethic that understands the sacredness, the sanctity of human life. So therefore that notion that God's image, we are somehow uniquely created by God, that has persisted all the way into uh, Western society. But I think the dominant feature of Western society actually comes from um, the Hellenistic world because uh, the church flourished in the Hellenistic world. The um, the Jewish Christian community is devastated by the Jewish war of AD 70. Um, it's hit by another war in AD 135. And the Greek, the Roman world basically sees this as a backwater, an insignificant corner. So therefore, as the church grows into the Hellenistic, the Roman world, it moves into Europe, and then it moves and creates this Western society. It has carried with it, without even realizing it, the values of Hellenism. So there is, uh, there is this notion, for instance, of, uh, well, I, I'm going to put individualism back into uh, this, this, this Roman and Greek world, this idea that somehow I can have autonomy, how we build our society, um, our civic posture, how we build our cities, how we think about democracy. Those are all ideas that have come out of that Hellenistic world. So for me, um, the modern Western world actually sees its legacy coming out of the Hellenistic environment. The great Renaissance in Europe and the Enlightenment both saw themselves as recreating the values of classical mm, Hellenistic or Greek civilization. We see it in architecture all over Europe and the United States. Um, and uh, yeah, maybe that's enough. I, I, you can go on for a long time about that. Okay, um, the next question. It, it gives me impression that there is no holy culture, not even the biblical culture. So is it possible to see gospel or kingdom of God as something that always becoming? In other words, is there any Christian culture anyway? 
That's brilliant question. That's a, I you know exactly what the question is. And uh, whoever wrote that question deserves to get an A on their paper, no matter what they write. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Um, okay. So let's, let's sort of be, yeah, we have to be very clear about a couple of things. When we read the scriptures, we have to sort out what is, um, what is, uh, what is simply descriptive of culture. God has to reveal himself inside of a culture. And yet the culture he chooses for that revelation is not sacred. And so therefore cultural practices, which are inside of say Judaism or in ancient Israel are not necessarily practices that we have to imitate. That is why now the Christians, um, now, now Jews had these two blended very closely together. And so therefore in the first century, they felt as if you had to have Jewish culture in order to have a faithful life with God. Um, what happens in the Hellenistic period is what dawns on people is that people have different cultures and there are cultures with different values inside of them. And therefore, do they deserve respect or do they deserve conquest? And so the Christian church in theology has always said, no, it is what, what's timeless and holy and sacred inside of the scriptures is that message that message which is timeless, that message which lives above culture. Those are the things. I mean, in the, in the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not kill is not tied to culture. It is true of any Indonesian as it is true of any Mexican. So therefore, what, what, what the early Christians decided was that not only as the gospel moves into the Hellenistic world, People who work inside of a city like Ephesus or Rome, <clears throat> they can speak any language they wish. They are not obligated to speak Greek. They're not obligated to speak Hebrew. They are not obligated to support the politics of a country in the Middle East. They're not obligated to pilgrimage to a temple, but they can stay where they are because God embraces and loves all cultures. Now, that idea is huge and it's really unusual in the ancient world. In the ancient world, your religion is tied to your tribal culture, period. But here the Christian church is seeing diversity and they've created a flexible cultural theology. That is gigantic. That explains why the church, the message of the gospel is transcultural and has moved all over the world. That's what Paul said. No Jews, no Gentiles, no woman, no man. Right. Galatians 3.28. Exactly right. So yeah, in Christ, there's no Jew or Gentile. There's no slave. Think of, just digest that verse in Galatians 3. There is no Jew nor Gentile, slave nor free, male nor female. In other words, those great boundaries that have been built all over the world in society, those fall apart when they meet Jesus. The biggest one there is Jew and Gentile. The others are important, but Jew and Gentile? That's like saying American and Indonesian, you know, in God's eyes, it's the same gospel. All right. Uh, next question. Uh, this is a short one. Uh, there are some people uh, use this terminology, save us for God, and there are use uh, the gods say, but this is Indonesian. I try my best. What do you think? Is it say, but for God or? or? I, I don't think, Carl, I understand it. I'm not, sure. I'm not getting it. Okay. Is this All a right. saying the... a phrase that people say in Indonesia? God say, is this a phrase that people say, yeah. God uh, save me? Uh, sorry, is this a phrase? What, what? Is, this, is this a phrase that Indonesians use? Uh, that say that says you know God save me or God's save me. No, it's not what say Seba, Seba, Saba, Saba. Uh, it's a Seba. Oh, God Sabbath. Yeah, God Sabbath or oh. Sabbath for. God. Is there any oh, 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 okay, I get it. Yeah, okay, I get it. Yeah, okay. So we refer to the Sabbath as God's Sabbath, God's rest. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I think that's fine. I like that. I like that idea very much. But keep in mind that. Christians are Sabbatarians, meaning we do acknowledge every seventh day 
but Christians have decided <clears throat> that we are going to rest not on the day of creation's rest, but on the day of recreation. In other words, the resurrection of Jesus. Sunday is our day because of the resurrection of Jesus, the recreation of the world. Yeah, this is probably the last question. I haven't got another one. Uh, what, what, what do you, uh, the, uh, it is quoted from John 18, 15. Uh, uh, I'll read it for you. Uh, Simon Peter was following Jesus, and so was another disciple. So yeah. I think this is about probably the, the disciple was known to the high priest and right. entered with Jesus into the court of the high priest. So right. is uh, this disciple Galilean or mm -hmm. I don't know? I mean, how could he be known by the high priest? Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. So therefore, um, what we have throughout the Gospel of John is this, um, this, this character who is not named, I think it is John himself, myself. I'm, I'm kind of traditional about this. And so therefore, this unknown person is, is John. <clears throat> now, um, this is a little bit complicated, and I, I wish I had a whiteboard behind me and I could draw on it. <laughs> but um, if you were to track all of the names of the people who are at the foot of the cross, okay? And you were to reconstruct who is related to Jesus. There is a really great argument. This is, uh, this is not mine. This comes from a, a, a Catholic scholar named Raymond Brown, very famous New Testament scholar, that, that actually, no surprise here, is that John, son of Zebedee, is somehow related to Jesus as a cousin. All right. And so therefore, we know that the, that the family of Jesus has got relations, has got family down in Jerusalem area. Remember when Mary was pregnant, she was able to go to Jerusalem. That means she has got relationships, family relationships in Jerusalem area. So therefore, these families, were, they tracked their extended families. So therefore, if, if, if John, the beloved disciple, is connected to the extended family of Jesus, then John, the beloved disciple, has got extended family in Jerusalem. Are you following? Is, that, is this working? <laughs> it's very hard to do verbally. Yeah. So if that's the yeah. case, do we have a connection to any of the priestly families there in Jerusalem? And honestly, there were thousands of people who understood they were a part of the priestly families. So therefore, I, that's, that's the idea, that, that somehow he has access, I would say, to the household there. And it might be one of the family members or the slave or somebody there recognizes him. It's one of those mysterious verses that we can only speculate about. We can only speculate. Yeah. Okay. Uh... It's 21, I mean, 9.13 p.m. I think uh, uh, I've been informed by the chairman that we need to uh, uh, close uh, this lecture, uh, professor. But I don't know uh, whether you still have time, probably another 15 minutes after this, uh, if, if, if the participants want to sure. continue. Yeah, yeah, sure. if somebody okay. would like to continue, sure. There are a couple of questions still here, probably towards the all right, so I would like to kindly request Ibu Pendeta Dr. Gernaida uh, to mm -hmm. lead us for the closing prayer uh, first. But brothers and sisters, if you still want to continue with Professor or, but by asking questions, uh, you are welcome to stay. But for those uh, brothers and sisters uh, who want to leave, don't worry, we will put you know, this lecture in YouTube, like we already did, you know, and distributed to brothers and sisters uh, for the last week's uh, uh, lecture. All right, uh, Othniel, would you mind uh, showing to the screen Ibu Pendeta Dr. Gernaida uh, from FTTBI to lead us in a prayer. Terima kasih Pak Carlo, maaf saya di jalan, jadi eh, mari kita berdoa. Eh, 
Kami berterima kasih kepada Tuhan untuk seluruh rangkaian studi di dalam dua minggu dan khususnya di malam ini. Kami diperkaya dengan berbagai hal khususnya untuk latar belakang perjanjian baru dan bagaimana kami harus menafsir Alkitab dengan baik. Tuhan memberkati hambamu Pak Giri yang sudah memberikan uh, insight, pemikiran, gagasan, juga penjelasan-penjelasan yang sangat baik di malam hari ini. Entah kami sebagai guru, sebagai student, atau apapun, atau juga pelayan Tuhan, birlah kiranya kami sekalian boleh diberkati. Tuhan terima kasih untuk pertemuan ini kepadamu kami menyerahkan pujian dan hormat. Demi nama Yesus kami bersyukur dan berdoa. Amin. Amin. Terima kasih Ibu Pendeta. Oke, okay, brothers and sisters, for those of you who still want to stay, we have uh, four to five questions here. Professor, we know that there are several assimilation and or in influence of Romans culture that are adopted by the Jewish, as you mentioned, and in right. your lecture, right? right? However, the question is, was there any Jewish culture adopted by the Roman citizens? If so, is it <laughs> also it the adaptation to Christianity? Wow. Hmm. Well, that's a good question. I have never, I have heard, I think, I thought I had heard every question up till now. But I've never heard that question before. So the question is, um, were there any Jewish values which were taken in by the Roman world? Oh, I, and I, yeah, is that the, that's the question, I think, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, that's the question. And I actually, I, I cannot think of one right now. Honestly, it's very difficult for me to think of one. And I think that the only time that happens is in the fourth century AD, in the early 300s, and it is brought into the Roman world by Christians who are carrying their Jewish scriptures with them. I mean, it, it is, it's, your question is almost like this. Imagine if I, am, if I said uh, that uh, China, uh, what if I said 2% of China is Indonesian? 2%. I'm just making this up. Why not? We'll have fun with this. And then you ask me, well, were the Indonesians in China? Oh, oh no, I have a student of mine who's Korean. And I just met her and I, she said, I'm Chinese. And I said, wait, you're Korean. She goes, I'm Korean Chinese. <laughs> and we've had this lovely conversation about the Korean minority in China. I didn't know about it. It's been there for a hundred years. So I said, well, what's it like? And she said, the Koreans in China are being changed by Chinese culture. And we're afraid we're going to disappear. And so I asked, well, did you change the Chinese? <laughs> and they said, and she said, nah, no. <laughs> China is just too big. No, it's just too big. So anyway, um, yeah, I, I, I just don't see it going the other way. Okay. So, uh... This is about the uh, Matthew 5, 20, 29. Uh, quote, the quote is, if anyone slapped you with the right cheek, turn to him with another you know, left cheek, right? That's right. right. Uh, how could you explain this you know, from, from Jesus' point of view? Is it uh, from, I don't know, the, the question is, is it from honor or from shame point of view? Right. And I think it's actually about revenge. Hmm. Um, it, is, it is a, this is culture... Well, um, I, I think most cultures around the world, uh, but I shouldn't say that. My culture and the culture in the Middle East certainly has this notion, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. So therefore, if you hurt me, I will hurt you back in the very same way. So tribal revenge actually is one of the things that almost destroyed Israel. And that's why they had special cities set up where people could flee so they wouldn't be subject to revenge. So if you kill my son, I'll come and kill two of your sons. <laughs> you kill, I kill two of your sons. The whole thing cycles terribly. So in a culture of revenge, um, how is it that I'm going to take a new posture? 
I think it's about that. So therefore, um, if you hurt me, my interest as a follower of Jesus is in reconciliation, not in revenge. I think that's, it's a code. It's a coded message, all right? It, the passage has been used by nonviolent pacifists for saying, this is why we don't go to war. And that may be a fair application of it. But I think for me, it, it is really about breaking a cycle that is so deeply embedded in so many humans. Carlo, you can tell me if Indonesians are like this too. You hurt me, I'm going to hurt you back. And the, it, maybe, maybe Indonesian culture is holier than American culture. <laughs> But, but Jesus is saying, that's not how we behave. Not an eye for an eye, but a cheek for a cheek. An eye for an eye make the world blind. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> okay. Uh, can you explain more about eschatology, or eschatology, eschatological concept of the Jews? Do they believe in heaven and hell? That's a really, really good question. Very good question. Whoever wrote that also gets an A. <laughs> okay, so this is a fairly dynamic concept in this period of time. It was debated. The Sadducees were not committed to this. The Pharisees were fully committed to this, and they believed that the Old Testament story is that there was, was that there is an afterlife. Elijah is one example of that afterlife that there is hope beyond the grave, that we are, God is conscious of us beyond the grave. You have this in the Psalms. So what is developing in this period of time is, I can actually talk about the geography of the afterlife. And so therefore they understand that there is an afterlife for everyone in Judaism, for the bulk of most Jews in this period of time. And um, they, uh, Those who are not living in a faithful relationship with God go to a place of fire, Gehenna, it's called. Uh, and then others go to what they would call Sheol, or a place of darkness, of shadows, or for some, it was called Abraham's bosom. You would join our ancestors. That's what you would do. And it was a place of rest. You know, Jesus actually uses the, this geography of the afterlife um, in his parable where he talks about a man named Lazarus who was very poor, he's outside of a man, rich man's gate, he, his dogs lick his wounds, he dies, and then he goes to be with Abraham. It's in Abraham's bosom. And then the rich man, of course, goes to the other place, Gehenna, and, um, and it's, a, it's a fun parable because they're talking back and forth to each other, you know, oh, Abraham, please tell, you know, help me. Anyway, um, The parable is really not to be used to reconstruct that people can from heaven and hell can talk to each other. It just shows us that Jesus can tell a story presuming that these categories exist. So anyway, in Jesus' day, if you were a Pharisee or you were living in the villages like Jesus, then you would have an assumption of life after death. So therefore, no one is, you know, when Jesus, what's surprising about Jesus is that when he dies, <clears throat> when he dies, What's surprising is not that he joins life after death. What's surprising about Jesus is that Jesus goes to the place of the dead, Abraham, Abraham's bosom. He takes the righteous dead, and he inaugurates the kingdom of heaven with them. In other words, he is the captain of the kingdom of heaven. He is leading the righteous dead. So he, you might say, he empties Abraham's bosom. He empties Abraham is his, his breath. He empties, he leads Adam and Eve. He leads Abraham and Moses. He leads the righteous into this place of God's glory and presence. Thank you. All right, uh, probably this is going to be the last question. Uh, uh, I, I think you just mentioned in your lecture that uh, even Jesus didn't, you know, travel more than probably 100 miles, I don't know. <laughs> And the question yeah, is, yeah. where was Jesus, you know, between at the age of 13 to 30 years of age? That's a classical question. We, we want to hear from you. <laughs> He was in Michigan. 
that's why Michigan is such a holy place to live. Okay. Well, yeah. So, you know, um, okay. So his family is in Bethlehem. There's a change of political leadership. The guy who is now running the whole area around Bethlehem and Judea is named Archelaus. He's a violent and dangerous man. So the family flees. They get out of there and they get out of Judea. And so therefore um, they go to Egypt. Um, there is a large Jewish community in Egypt, a very large Jewish community there. And so therefore they take refuge undoubtedly inside of the Jewish community. Now that has led to all kinds of speculation about what Jesus was doing in Egypt and uh, are there places in Egypt you can go today to see where little Jesus stood. There are stories about baby Jesus in Egypt. The Gospel of Thomas has a lot of these. So anyway, you're, um, that's my, my hypothesis, but actually I prefer Michigan. Okay. All right, brothers and sisters, please activate your camera again. We come to an end. Uh, you may greet professor here, say, you know, uh, hello, probably, even though we are at the end or saying goodbye to professor. And you can, uh, you know, uh, unmute uh, Otniel, could you release the lock so that we can greet each other and give the opportunity uh, to brothers and sisters to say something to professor. <laughs>